Today, the Human Rights Bill continued its rather predictable way through Parliament. It's almost certain to become law before the year is out, and once it does, we'll all enjoy better protection from nasty governments who would abuse our human rights. Right? Well, perhaps not. Not everybody's convinced that judges, largely white, male and middle class, are the best folk to defend our rights. Yet the bill involves a huge increase in judicial power, a fact acknowledged during tonight's debate in the Commons. We are entering into new territory as far as the position of the judges are concerned. I think it is important that we sense, spend some time on getting this right and recognise as well the difficulties which judges will face uh, in interpreting this uh, European legislation. The government spokesman there on the Human Rights Bill speaking to packed government benches. We can see the huge interest on the government side on this matter, though no doubt the opposition benches were pretty empty as well. Michael Davis, former judge, if this Human Rights Bill becomes law, will we all be sleeping sounder in our beds? I hope so, and I hope the judges will come round and tuck you in at night, metaphorically, of course. Yes, uh, you had me worried there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds I, like an abuse of human rights. No, I think uh, judges... Judges will do what they swear to do when they take the judicial oath. They will carry out the law, and if Parliament tells them that they must, they're the people to interpret the law, they will do so. But will, will having a Bill of Human Rights, which is what this amounts to, writing right. the European Convention into our own English, Scottish, British law, will that improve our human rights? It will improve one thing, that we'll be able to get our justice quicker uh, in uh, England and Scotland and Wales, uh, and no doubt in Northern Ireland as well, uh, whether it will improve it is a matter we shall have to see how it comes out in the wash. We hope it will. Uh, speaking for myself, I declare this, that I'm a rather a non-interventionist. Uh, I believe in saying that anything that is not unlawful, you should be free to do. And if it's unlawful, then you should be stopped in one way or another, either by civil or criminal proceedings. This is an attempt for a positive law. It may be good, but whether it will be, we shall have to see how it turns out. Adam Tompkins, quicker, uh, Michael was saying, because we now won't have to go to Strasbourg, but will it be more effective? Is writing human rights into law the best way of protecting our rights? No, I don't think it is. I think, ideally, um, we would not try and rely on an outdated uh, Bill of Rights, um, and I have to say, uh, an outdated Bill of Rights being enforced by a largely outdated judiciary to protect our, our civil liberties. Liberty is ill in Britain. Uh, we have the right to vote, of course. We have, you know, in comparison with lots of countries around the world, we're very well off, of course. But we have a lot of legislation on our statute books which have been put there over the course of the last 20 years or so, uh, which, uh, in my view, uh, erodes our liberties too much. And you don't this think this bill rights, would help this that? This bill of rights will, on the contrary, it will make it harder to change. Edward Gardner, you're a QC. Will this... Uh piece of legislation be good for our human rights? I, I, rather, as Sir Michael said, I, I'm, it's too early to say. It's certainly not going to do any harm. Whether it'll do any good is another matter. Traditionally, this country has had a, a, a remedy and duty-based system of law and not a, a rights-based uh, system of law. It's going to be interesting to see how it develops, how the courts develop it, and how Parliament reacts to the courts developing it. All right. The fact that the Tories didn't do it in their 18 years in power would suggest that they're pretty lukewarm, sniffy about uh, the project? There's a full range of opinion within the Conservative Party over this, but the, the opposition... You mean you're divided on this too? Uh, no, I'm not, <laughs> no, no we ta we've taken an intelligent... We're Europe in it. <laughs> we've, we've taken an intelligent interest in the subject, which I think is uh, to be commended. Uh, no, there are obviously... Are your benches who were empty there. Uh, Fiona and, McTaggart. You know, it's not it's that uh, it's intelligent but, 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 but Fiona, if, um, if we're going to have a Bill of Rights in this country, which there's a lot of people think we, we should... Why are we incorporating um, a Bill of Rights, which, as Adam says, is rather out of date, drawn up in the 50s? Why don't we go for a full-blown British Bill of Rights that reflects cool Britannia? To use a well, I don't think phrase that, that cool your Britannia is in any way likes. relevant to rights. No, but you know what I mean. But, uh, <laughs> a, a, a Bill of Rights that reflects Britain in 1998. Because we have no tradition of debating the concept of rights here. The last Bill of Rights in this country gave, I think, five rights to the people of the country and eight rights to parliamentarians. We don't have a concept that human beings, ordinary people, have rights. So, but we do need some mechanism which affirms a clear framework of rights, particularly while government is giving power to other bodies. 
if, if you're going to devolve well, you power, mean like the Scottish Parliament, like the Scottish the Parliament Belfast from, um, exactly Cardiff. if you are going to devolve power it seems to me that there needs to be a clear framework of rights so what we said is that we will use this which is theoretically the rights that people in Britain have had but as the judges pointed out in practice is often a right which people cannot get for years and years but and years as a starting point with Edward, framework, Edward, you, the, the, since Fiona interrupted you, you can interrupt Fiona. Uh, one all, scored <laughs> all. <laughs> the, 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 the judge is keeping the score. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> Fiona says that this convention uh, provides rights for people, but of course the convention, if you look at it, provides as many exceptions to the rights as it does rights themselves. So what the government is introducing into British domestic law is merely a convention of exceptions rather than a convention on rights. And I want to come on to that in a minute, but I want to, uh, Michael to bring you and Do you accept what Fiona's saying there, that... Um, that, that, that in Britain we've not been too positive about rights. I mean, when you sat on the bench, didn't you have individual rights uppermost in no, your mind? No, you not didn't. individual rights in the sense we're talking about it. I looked at the facts of the case and either gave a judgment or summed it up, applying the law as it stood. And sometimes hard cases make bad law. But I didn't regard myself as carrying some sort of standard, I tried to do my job and it was for the public and the Court of Appeal to say whether I did and the litigants. But a very good point has been made. I think you made it, Andrew, and it's worth just developing for a moment. Uh, the Human Rights Bill, our Human Rights Bill, I don't know whether all viewers realise this, reproduces exactly the important Articles 8 and 10 of the European Convention. Now that is decades and decades old. It came into existence because European countries in those days, uh, after the last war, wanted to lay down a code, if you like, which would prevent the sort of horrors that occurred. And we signed up to that now, then, so we have adopted, there's no turning back, we've got it already. The only thing that has been delayed is incorporating it into our law and the Human Rights Bill does it. We can't get out of it now even if we wanted to, so but it's I, there. Adam, you were saying that some of this is outdated, but aren't certain rights? Um, they've been around for a long yeah. while. I mean, they've mm. been around since the French Revolution yeah. or before, or since Thomas not. Paine. New Zealand, Canada yeah, have sure. very strong legislation on, on human rights. Aren't we just catching up? And stronger in many ways than the European Convention on Human Rights. I mean, New Zealand and Canada have had the opportunity in the last 10 years or so of introducing 15 years or so of introducing their own bills of rights, having learnt from that European experience. We're introducing a bill of rights which isn't our own, not learning from that European experience. Let me just give you an, oh, an example. Yeah, where would I mean, their rights be tougher well, uh, than the take, ones that we're take, about to incorporate? Take speech, for example. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, liberal commentators would argue uh, that freedom of expression or freedom of speech is the paradigmatic uh, civil liberty or human right which needs to be protected uh, in, in law. Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is one of the articles which is being incorporated, uh, under the Human Rights um, Bill, um, provides for a right to freedom of expression and then provides for ten exceptions to that right for freedom of expression. So that the government, so that the effect of the Bill of Rights will be that the government has the constitutional power for the first time in English law to restrict our right to freedom of speech if it's in accordance with law, whatever that means, if it's necessary in a democratic society, if it's proportionate, whatever mm. that means, and if it's for a certain prescribed aim. Mm. And it will be for judges, you know, as you said in your introduction, unelected, old, white, upper middle class, oh, Oxbridge on. educated, oh, legal I judges. To, 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 I've well, got much better cracks sure. about that. I've got to come on to, 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 to that issue to because yeah. our, our Rastafarian about, judge about whether, here tonight is the speech, going to oppose that. About, well, about whether the interference of the speech is proportional. Or not. Sure. I mean, that's <laughs> what worries me. <laughs> I just have been feeling. No, no, Fiona, I wanted to pick up from 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 the point the the point that that Adam was making here. I mean, I. Since my mother taught me to do my homework, I looked mm. through the mm. European Convention of Human Rights, which is my little blue book that I, I have here tonight. And what Adam says is right, is that where, where a right is stated, there are half a dozen to a dozen caveats on this. And doesn't that give the government the chance to get its way by getting the judicial system to concentrate on the exceptions. On, s on some of the rights there are caveats, on others like the right to freedom from torture and inhuman and degrading, degrading treatment, there is no uh, exception or exemption of course at all. Don't, don't we have that so, freedom already in Britain? Uh, it isn't uh, inherent in this, and as you know, there have been cases which suggest that the UK has, has breached uh, some of those protections in the past and has been ruled against uh, at the well, European so, Court so of Human the Rights and the Germans. Uh, on, on this question. So clearly we haven't protected it effectively. But on the issue of freedom of expression, yes, it's paradigmatic, but it is also... So it's what? 
Adam used Two the phrase it's paradigmatic, i.e. it means. is now, at the heart of English? a concept of liberty. It is the core idea, concept okay, of liberty, and he's right. Yeah. And yet it is also the right ca which can conflict with other people's rights most acutely. For example, does a racist have the right to stir up racial hatred and to encourage other people to murder or maim someone because of their race? Their race. Well, isn't that example, covered by the does, race relations does, act? But what this is saying is that there is the right to free speech, but that there are circumstances like the Race Relations Act in which a government can legitimately restrict it. So that, for example, I shouldn't have the right to maliciously um, uh, libel people. These are the kind of exceptions that he's talking about. So it's not um, uh, frilly exceptions. It's not, you know, the government has a, a, a free pass. It seems to me that where we need to go to from here, and, and I think you're right that this isn't adequate, but where we need to go to from here is actually to examine those points at which rights do conflict, to get a debate in Britain about how we could create mm. a sufficient and excellent we Bill of Rights. We need a first step, we don't isn't it? Uh, to, to, to have a debate. Uh, it is already against the law to be racially abusive. Mm. Uh, there's a statute which says so, and if you if you are racially abused, and to stir up racial hatred, whatever you you can be fined or sent to prison. And if you torture somebody, there's a criminal law. Of course. Uh, so what uh, the but the there government? Isn't a positive right so just let me finish the point. The, what the government is doing is introducing uh, a wish list. There's nothing wrong with the wish list, but it's not going to improve the human rights of the citizens of this country by having the convention in place. It will provide an opportunity for lawyers. It will provide an opportunity for judges to. Uh, work out the competition between the rights uh, in one part of the convention and the other. Articles 8 and 10 are the, are the classic example. These are the basic human rights in the 8 That's and 10. Right. Yes. That we well, come to well, associate it, with a democracy. Well, it's freedom of speech Adam, and the right to Adam, 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 That's pretty basic. It's not in doubt. I agree with that. Unless you're on this program, then we talk to you all the time. <laughs> uh, Adam, surely some of the biggest advances that we've regarded in rights, you take female emancipation, didn't come about because of human rights legislation. They came about because people protested on the streets well, and, right. and won the argument. Did. Of course they did. I mean, you can't rely on a Bill of Rights and you can't rely on the judiciary to achieve um, progress in, in politics, which is what we're talking about now. I mean, women didn't get the vote uh, because judges said that they should. On the contrary, judges throughout the late 19th and early 20th century uh, interpreted the relevant legislation so as specifically to exclude women from the ability to... So it was a right not to, to have the vote. Well, well, that's how it was interpreted <laughs> the by Parliament members. Parliament could have introduced uh, votes for women at any time. Judges And eventually Parliament yeah. did. That's the whole point. It was, it was, it was a change which came through Parliament and yeah. through politics. But, but, but Michael, if, but Michael if, if, we'd had, uh, if we'd had a Bill of Rights in, in, in that time, couldn't judges have implemented that because it would have been a human right that everybody had the vote and the fact that women didn't have the vote would have allowed judges to say you're in contravention of our human rights? That's exactly the point. If Parliament had passed a bill saying everyone shall have the right to vote, uh, then judges could have interpreted that to include women and I believe they would even in the 19th century. But that's the whole point. It's for Parliament to lay down what they intend. Parliament is supreme, the supreme lawmaker above judges, and if a judge, if, if there's judge-made law that changes it, Parliament can change it back, and they not infrequently do. So uh, that is the situation, and it's absolutely wasteful debating to go rabbit on and on and on about white middle-class uh, judges. We want the best judges. If they're black women, let's have them. If they're white middle-class men, we must have them. Uh, the best judges we want who will interpret the law justly and fairly to all citizens. It's well, as simple so as that. If, uh, since you raised this issue, let, let me come to no, it. I'm sorry, you're probably going to talk no, about it No, you raised it again, but I'll, no, we'll do no, it no, now. Forgive you've, me. You've, no, it you was, brought it, it up. It came it, on the it, from it, your it, right if twice. That, if that's the case. Insulting judges. Academics are paid to do that. That's the, well, we can beat up an academics in a minute. <laughs> but if that's the case, if it is, if our judges should be a meritocracy, how come over 90% of our senior judges are male, white, and middle class? Well, I can answer that very simply uh, in, uh, in two quite short statements. First of all, uh, it's a fact that women and the, uh, uh, and the ethnic minorities are only just, as it were, coming through. The second point is you've got to have it to interpret the law. You've got to have people with some ability and training to do that sort of thing. And uh, you can't, the last Lord Chief Justice, not Lord Bingham, Lord Taylor said, nobody wants you to go out and have the Court of 
appeal staff by three excellent chaps from the local building side. They wouldn't be able to write the judgment satisfactory. Whether you have a, uh, a, a sort of a tribunal or constitutional court with lay input, we may come on to. That's quite another matter. I would welcome it. Oh. The, second, the second point is... I that thought that was the second point. Oh, was it? Yes, that was. <laughs> Fiona. Yeah, you, you're a little you're, bit sad. Fiona, you're, sni you're, yeah, you're sniggering there. But this, uh, about some of the things Michael's saying, but this Bill of, of Human Rights substantially increases the power of judges as they are just now, not the way Michael might think they become as we become more representative of society. Are you comfortable with that? Well, it, it doesn't really vary substantially. I think this is an well, overstatement of the case. It doesn't decrease it. What, what, what the bill says is that judges have a right to say that they believe a particular piece of legislation is in conflict with the bill. And then they with leave the it up with, the, with the convention, with the act as it will be. And then they leave it up to Parliament to sort it out. Now, there have been cases in the past where Parliament has been informed by eminent judges that it is a, in breach of or about to breach the European Convention to which we're a signatory. I mean, the one that I know most about is the Immigration Rules case in 1979, where the House of Commons blithely debated changes in the Immigration Rules and said, it's up to us, we don't care if it breaches the Convention. Uh, they were informed by Lord Scarman and many others, and there was a select committee report, and they knew it would breach it. And five years later, the women who were not allowed to live with their husbands were able to live with their husbands because they won a case at Strasbourg. That can't be just. Right, it uh, isn't a grown-up uh, way to run uh, a Edward, society. Th this bill is inevitably going to politicise the judiciary to some extent, isn't it? Uh, that, I think, will be the, the consequence. Whether that's the intended consequence is another matter. Mm. What we're going to get is these declarations of in incompatibility being made over areas which are of great political and social controversy. It will mean that the judges will be criticised by members of parliament and editors of newspapers hmm. who will say, Judge you Bloggs, Judge Bloggs <laughs> has got, is completely wrong. He's, he's completely misinterpreted public opinion on this. And in any event, it's for the, for the House of Commons to interpret a public opinion. So there, there's going to, there always should be a creative tension between those two limbs of the Constitution, the judiciary and parliament. That's fine. But what I fear is we will get a destructive tension between the judges and the, uh, and the House of Commons. And the House of Commons is not always a very civilized arguer of its case. Uh, the judges, of course, by the virtue of their office, have to be. Uh, and there will be... Uh, so you see a, co a conflict, There a will clash. become an inequality of, of reason, and there will be uh, arguments which will lead to a diminution in the respect that people have for our Constitution. Adam, are you, are, are you as sanguine as Fiona that uh, the current judiciary can handle this increase in power that they're about to get? No, I think that, that I mean, these nice points about constitutional balance and separation of powers are all very well, but I think there's something missing from what, what we've been saying, and, and that's a rather unfashionable concept in many quarters these days, the old concept of democracy. And what worries me <laughs> um, about the Bill of Rights is the, is the, is the kinds of, uh, I would agree with Edward on this point, political issues, that seems to me the, the, the key to it, really, the, the kinds of political issues that judges are going to be uh, responsible for making decisions on now, which hitherto they, uh, they've not had the last word on, like, like the classic example, which has caused political chaos and conflict and pain in Poland, Germany, Ireland, the United States of America, all of which have been inflicted with bad bills of rights, abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, article 2 of the um, European Convention, uh, which is, again, one of the articles which is going to be incorporated under this Act, um, uh, says that everybody has the right to life. It doesn't say what everybody means. It doesn't say yeah. whether, whether the word everybody extends to fetuses. And, and, and it seems to me that the, the, the problem is, you know, why should it be judges, whatever class they come from, you know, whether they're the best chaps in the building society or whoever, why should it be judges who have the last word on the legality or constitutional well, absolute of the Because when Parliament is going word. to give them certain jobs to do. It's Parliament's right. giving it to yes. them, right. and, and they can... And I wish it weren't. That's but, the but point. Michael, Parliament uh, would keep this power for itself. But Michael, going? how do you feel about the consequence of this uh, 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 thing that Parliament's about to do, which is that it, judges in this country, certainly compared to the United States, have been pretty anonymous people. Um, you could now be thrown into the spotlight by your decisions. Well, if Parliament chooses to throw us into the spotlight, we'll have to face it. Uh, judges have to do what Parliament lays down as the law, and they must interpret and apply it. I mean, take something that's not uh, strictly germane, the death penalty. Now, I 
personally am not in favour of the death penalty, but if I were a judge and the death penalty were enforced, I wouldn't say, oh dear me, I can't possibly try that case, I might have to sentence the man to death. I should resign if I'm not prepared to do my job. And so I wouldn't be uncomfortable uh, doing uh, the sort of cases that may arise in this particular instance. And the other point is that uh, Parliament uh, said, well, Parliament ought to decide this. On any bill, any act, and I'm sure Edward and Fiona will confirm this, Parliament cannot possibly legislate for every single set of circumstances exactly. which arise. So somebody's got to interpret that. Who's going to do that? But, but so well, co servant. coming to the interpretation, Sorry. which the judges are now going to be, uh, to be to doing, do. more, asking to do more well, of. We haven't asked but, for but it. I understand that. But Fiona, what, in, in many other countries, America, France, Germany, probably I think New Zealand and Canada mm. and Australia as well, certain human rights are encapsulated in the constitution of that country. Yes. And when a government or a parliament um, crosses the boundary on these human rights, the judges have the right to say, sorry, that's yes. against the constitution, against our basic law, you cannot do that. Strike it down. You and, and now you're not giving the judges that right. line. No. Why not? Well, absolutely not, because I, actually this is one area in which Edward and I agree, which is that the separation of powers helps to work it. It is the job of parliament to work out the laws and it is the job of judges to see where those laws where the you know to interpret them mm. in practice now i'm afraid that that you know the, the specter of for example the right to life provision in article 2 leading to judges striking down our abortion laws is unfounded not only because they don't have the right to strike it down but also because the case law in europe makes quite clear that that is not the uh, way that the uh, convention has been interpreted. And so in my view, you know, Parliament would be quite within its right to assert its uh, present legislative provisions but to Fiona, allow that. Would you well, like the judges to ha in Britain, our most senior judges, to have power similar to the Supreme Court in the United States where, where a government is clearly in breach of our basic constitutional rights, the judges say to the government, sorry, you may be the government, but you are in breach of our human rights. You cannot do that. No, I Why wouldn't. Not? I wouldn't because, first of all, you know, I'm always tempted not to because of who the judges are. I mean, I don't want to be rude <laughs> about the present judiciary. That's my job. Um, no, no, but what I, you know, but you're going to give them a lot more power. Your claim was yeah. that those who have the training and experience will, you know, isn't it a sad society that the only people who have the training and experience to be judges are the kind of people we presently have, many of whom are great individuals but who are not representative of society as a whole and who do not even look like the people who they generally try. And I think that's a tragedy and it breeds disrespect for the law and that is a problem for us all. But, but it is the job of us elected members to... Deeply facile, why is that? Because judges are not there as representatives. They are disinterested. They are non-political animals. They are there to interpret the law that Parliament hands across to them. But Dan, we, we're all a product of our background and upbringing and education. We're not, no one's completely disinterested. Well, it, it, they may have private views, but they don't allow them uh, to interfere with the judicial uh, function that they perform. But the, I, I, sorry, Adam, All yes. of this may, may well be true if you're deciding a technical issue of the law of chancery or something, but we're, we're not talking about, mm. about, about, about that, that kind of decision making under a Bill of Rights. We're talking about what we earlier on agreed was political decision making. The, question, the yeah. question, for example, of, I mean, if abortion is a duff issue, then some issue to do with, uh, with privacy and, the, and the, whether the press, I can't remember whether the Press Complaints Commission comes within Article 8 or whatever, but... Uh, the know, government they, managed to strike of, that out. Well, they've been trying to, yeah. From uh, Fleet Street. Um, but the, the, but <laughs> Th th these really. big political questions are going to be decided by a fantastically but unrepresentative part of our society. I don't believe they are going to decide it. We've, we've, several of us have said about three times that the judge's job is to interpret the law and apply it. I don't personally think judges should have the American Supreme Court power. You don't? That's a matter of striking down. They should advise, if you like, oh. inverted commas, make a decision, the government will review the situation, they'll either fall in with the decision and apply it, or if they're satisfied they have a mandate to uh, 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 take a different course, they will alter the law. I mean, that's the really innovative thing about the way we frame this law. It's yeah. unique internationally, that we have actually done it like that and not that's given the, right the judges way. the right I'm to strike sure it down. But, 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 but Edward, as a Conservative, presumably with a, a certain scepticism about the power of the state, if the judges haven't got the right to, or the power to say to government, you have overridden uh, some basic human rights with this legislation, 
who do we, the people, depend on because if there's an elective dictatorship, as a conservative once called it in Parliament? Well, we may be certain uh, there was in fact a retired law lord who's, who, who described the present government in precisely those terms in the uh, debates in the House of Lords on the, on the Human Rights Bill. This is but pre conser previous conservatives have also described conservative governments in that way. So who that. do we depend on? Well, we depend on a number of people, uh, and that's why we have a separation of powers. We depend upon the judges dispassionately to interpret the law and to deliver justice uh, accordingly. We depend upon Parliament to make laws which are in line with the consent of the people, uh, and we depend upon the executive uh, to hold itself in account to Parliament uh, on behalf of the, of the people. There are, th there are th three uh, wings there, or three limbs there, and each must work in concert with the other, but what I fear is but that... the system uh, has failed. It has not failed. It, it, it's simply that the, the new government wants to do something new, and so it's, it thinks it will improve people's well, position. Well, that's what new governments do, if you can cast that's your that's mind back to 79. They're perfectly <laughs> <in things. laughs> they're perfectly Some new things, that was why you I seem was, to get elected we were, They were perfectly <laughs> entitled to do that. But you just run out of new things to do, Edward. Uh, Adam, let me ask you this. If, if we cannot depend on Parliament, if we cannot if we're not prepared to give power to the judges because we have reservations about our judges in some ways giving them that power what about something like a human rights commission well ultimately you think you know i think we have to rely on ourselves to protect our rights i think if something is going on that we don't like we have to get on the street and shout about it because that's how things have changed but what about and, a and, commission and that sort of represented uh, that did, had some lay well, people sure. on it well, and uh, fine. as we, well we as legal minds yeah let's do it let's get some people from the house of lords let's get some people from the house of commons and have some kind of a joint parliamentary commission on on rights i mean i think that i, I, don't, I wouldn't have any problem oh, with I was that. thinking that maybe you could get on the human rights well, commission very much yeah. how are you going to deal with the manifold thousands of individual cases that arise and interpret it. You can't have a body of 10 or 20 people uh, doing that. It's uh, impractical. No, you can't have a body which, which is of that nature which enforces a Bill of Rights, but you could certainly have pre-legislative scrutiny within Parliament with a specific oh, aim you know, I'm of looking... I'm talking about the cases of interpretation that arise. Uh, what about it? What about it? has you... had pre-legislative scrutiny in the no, past, as no. in the case when I described, no. absolutely ignored it. We have to create a duty for but, it to... But, Fiona, control. what about... Uh, because as I understand it, the government hasn't quite ruled this out. What is your own personal view? What about a Human Rights Commission in Britain? Well, the government has talked about a joint committee of both houses of Parliament, and I think that's actually quite a bright uh, place to go next. Uh, first, because I think it would be very helpful to have members of the House of Lords on it, many of whom have experience in oh, this field. Well, the House of Lords? Lords? Uh, I thought they were going to get places <laughs> in the lottery, <laughs> as I suggested. Well, in the House well no, I'm merely talking about people who have long experience in the law who I think would be able to contribute in this way. What about some and ordinary think, folk on this committee? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think that we should like be Adam moving, we should be moving yeah, you, to a situation <laughs> where we do have, <laughs> where we have a human rights commission, but at the moment we have a number of commission type bodies hmm. which are are charged with bits of this, like the Commission for Racial Equality and so on. We've got to sort out how we work these all together. So we need okay. something which brings them together. Fiona, thank you. You had the last word here. That's it for tonight. Thanks to my guests, Edward Gardner, Adam Tompkins, he and myself have just had a job application, Michael Davis and Fiona McTaggart. There's no midnight hour tomorrow night. Shame. But Janice Street Porter will be here on Monday asking if politicians understand the youth vote of today. And I'll be back next Wednesday night. Thanks for joining us. Good night.